the teachings of the Upanishads are the highest watermark of philosophical investigation, almost like Socratic in nature. They are almost uh, like hanging out in Athens in the sixth century. You know, it is that level of conversation or hanging out with the Buddha in the sixth century. It's an Axis age philosophy, right? So what does Axis age mean? Axis age means that if you look around the world and you look at China, you have Lao Tzu and Taoism and Confucianism blossoming in the sixth century. If you look at Greece, you have Socrates and Aristotle and Plato and all of that blossoming up there from that sixth century onwards. Pythagoras before them and it just blossomed into. And what, what was the common? In India, we get the Buddha, we get the Upanishads, we get yoga all at the same time, right? These amazing. So why did this happen? And this is a great dialogue that's been going on in anthropology and religious circles for a long time. But the belief was that this was the age in which people started settling down into city civilizations in a big way. Giant cities were forming. And the big question became that you weren't anymore a hunter gatherer, you weren't anymore a farmer and a, or a, you were now a specialized person. You know, you were bartering your speciality in the marketplace. So you were a potter or you were a wheel maker or you were a warrior or you were a king or you were a priest or you were did writing and astronomy. You had a specialization, right? And this, many anthropologists claim, is why the male-dominated religions take over at this time. Because it's all about records and writing and details and no cycles of nature required. Everything is about control. And controlling society, controlling cosmos, controlling planting seasons, controlling everything. So the huge, the Vedic religion becomes very masculine at this time. And in reaction to the Vedic religion in India, because before the Vedic religion was nature, you know, integrating with nature, Indra, the senses, Vayu, wind, Agni, fire, you know, um, all these things were Aditi, the sun, you know, the, the beautiful sun, Saraswati, the river, everything was mother nature, was nature everywhere, right? Now, the same people took this Vedic religion and turned it into a hierarchy. And by they added this 10th mandala in the Rig Veda, which gave the caste system to India. So you get the priest class, the warrior class, the trader and craft class, and then the labor class who would till the land and do the work and whatever. And everybody had to fit into that somehow. So by the time of the Buddha, by the time of Socrates, by the time all these city civilizations were very hierarchical, were very controlled, and a lot of people were resisting this. There was a huge reaction towards it, right? So the biggest reaction in, in, the, in India was the Buddhist reaction. Right. Buddha comes into being at this time and says, no, nope, this is all bullshit. You can liberate yourself from suffering, from your, your, your city life, all this crap, and just meditate and you will be fine. Right. And so the, it, it is really funny, but the, the first students of the Buddha were all children of rich craftspeople and traders of the city of Benares. You know, they were, they quit their, you know, daddy's money and went off to live in the ashram, you know, <laughs> sound familiar, right? <laughs> Sounds like the 60s, right? <laughs> Just drop out, take acid, go find a guru. That's it. And Buddha was the biggest guru of the time. There was no doubt about that. But parallel to the Buddha were a whole bunch of other gurus, right? And you had the Upanishadic gurus, you had the Shramanic gurus, you had the Jain gurus, you had the yoga gurus. My God, if you were a young kid, you know, 20 something in Benares or in Magadh in India or in cities of China or in Athens, you could find a teacher. You know, there were cool teachers around. You know, you could go and you could join a cult and you would be initiated into the mysteries. You know, oh, it was wonderful. Right. Great time. So. This period was very exciting along the Gangetic Plain. And at the same time, another reaction was occurring to the Vedic dominance of the Brahmin priests and all of that, which was these peripheral seers, rishis, meditators, living in ashrams across the forests of North India and South India, 
started having these dialogues that we now know as the Upanishads, right? From a thousand BC onwards. And they asked a very interesting question. They said, well, you put butter into the fire. You, you, you worship the fire. You worship the smoke. You worship the air. You worship. Isn't that also inside me? And what, what about me? Who am I? Right? You know, and this was the first time in history, anywhere around the world, you start seeing people asking the question of who am I? Right? Isn't that interesting? That there was no, you couldn't find it in Homer. You couldn't find it in the Puranas. You couldn't find it in the ancient Rig Veda of I or me or who am I? You know, never. You know, we were all limbs of a society. We were all parts of the big structure of society. But suddenly, the question of who am I becomes the biggest question amongst the beginning of this movement around India. And the Upanishads came up with a series of teachings that were just fascinating, right? This is a great painting showing you the ideal of the Upanishad, just like going to, you know, Arthur going to Merlin, you, you would find this wise old sage in the forest living in his ashram and you would go and sit at his feet and he would teach you the mysteries of the universe. You know, this was the picture that was being sold in the marketplaces of the Indian cities that give it up, go, go find, go find the truth, you know, go up, you go to the forest. Of course, you know, don't worry about the mosquitoes and the snakes that are going to bite you, but all's good. You will go and live in the ashram, go and live in the ashram. It was very cool, but it was a beautiful idea because schools, people would send their children to these rishis to learn, you know, and, and these rishis. So the average age of students in these ashrams was between 13 and 19. They would come there before going back into the world and, and they would learn what Brahman was, what God was, what their role was, you know, and things like that. So Swami Vivekananda took those great teachings and brought it back into the world in the 1900s, early 1900s, right? He was the first big reviver of, in the modern age of the Vedanta, of the Upanishads, of the teachings of the Upanishads. And he said this, he said, the Upanishads are the great mine of strength. Therein lies strength enough to invigorate the whole world. And the whole world can be vivified, made strong, energized through them. They will call with trumpet voice upon the weak, the miserable and the downtrodden of all races, all creeds and all sects to stand on their feet and be free. Freedom, physical freedom, mental freedom and spiritual freedom are the watchwords of the Upanishads. Woo! Right? That was pretty powerful advocacy. Now, what he was saying, the word Upanishad literally means what you and I are doing right now. I'm, I'm whispering in your ear. Hello, come, come and listen to me. Let me whisper some secrets in your ear. Let me tell you about Atman, about Brahman, about Kundalini. Let me tell you about these things, right? This was... Upa means near, to sit near at the feet of somebody who is able, who has seen Brahman and seen Turiya and gone to Turiya and listening to them talk about it and philosophize about it, right? That's what Upanishad means, right? To sit near and absorb, right? You're sucking my data, right? <laughs> That's what you're doing. <laughs> Now, what does that mean in, in, in terms of practice? So, one of the things that I wanted to tell you is that the biggest question that was being asked in the Upanishads, and it's also the same question was asked in Buddhism in the 6th century or so, was who am I, right? And the Upanishads put forward a very interesting suggestion that really captured the imagination of the world later, now in the modern age, that you, little you, you the self, you the jiva, you the human being, are actually one and the same as the universal mind behind everything. 
That's a big one, isn't it? And they said that inside you is the spark of that infinite divinity called the jiva or the atman. And that jiva is the same as the mind of the whole universe, Brahman. Right? And the biggest beautiful phrase they came up with was tat vam asi. Thou art that. You are it. Remember, I keep telling you, you are it, you are it, you are it. That was their biggest message, that you are the same essence as that divine mind behind everything. That non-dual, beautiful, genderless mind behind the universe. You know, And, and so the, the journey of the seeker was like being sucked into the black hole of the galaxy. There's a telos pulling us and saying, this is your true destiny. This is your purpose. You are stuck in this maya. They call it maya, illusion of life. And you are stuck in this life and you think this is it. But your true destiny is at the source of everything. That's where you're going. And where does that source lie? Not out there in the black hole. Where? Inside you. In your heart. Right? The Turiya state. This is the, what a, I mean, just think about it. Out of animistic, shamanistic, Kabbalistic religions of that time, madness of that time, a philosophy like this emerges. Right? That's, that you're it. You're divine. You are God. Right? You just forgot. You don't know. You don't remember. That was it. I mean, that's where Ramdas and all got, you are it. You know, that's where it all came from. This whole, you are it. So, how do you feel after hearing that? That a whole bunch of crazy Indians 3,000 years ago sitting in meditation, probably high on some good psilocybin mushrooms, sat there writing the Soma. They've forgotten, they'd given away, and they were just contemplating. They're just thinking about, just like Socrates was later, thinking about, what am I? What am I? Right? Am I the body and the senses? No. Because they'll they fail me. I'll get old. I won't be able to see clearly. I won't be able to sense clearly. They lie to me all the time. Am I the mind? That's fantasizing and dreaming all the time. It can't be. It's never in one place. It's never steady. Am I the the deep state of of, of sleeping and being? Meh. Even that ends, and I keep coming back to this sucky reality. You know. So I must be something greater. Something, there must be a part of me that's immortal, a part of me that's essence, a part of me that is the, the seed of everything, right? So just imagine from this one dialogue over a thousand year period in India, we get all these philosophies of yoga and tantra and Vedanta and all these come out of this flowering of thought, right? What a wonderful... Now, it's not like everybody was talking about the Upanishads back then. <laughs> Nobody was talking about the Upanishads back then. Just in these forest ashrams, that's it. Nobody... You think people in the cities knew what the hell that was? They had no idea. So when Buddha sets up a camp outside the biggest city of the, of the time, Benares, and he sets up in Bodh Gaya, and people start coming out of the city to come and listen to him talk on the weekends, you know, oh, it's Sunday, I'm going to go check out Buddha, he's talking, you know, I'm going to go listen to his lecture. They all would go out there and every week people would give up their lives and come and join, come and join, come and join this search, right? This good. And the same thing was happening in the ashrams, but the ashrams were much more Brahminical in their nature. So they were, had to be, they were a bit limiting, so they even took less people than the Buddha did. Buddha took everybody, right? But the Upanishadic teachers and all did not take everybody. Did not. Right? 
So this was not known. This was known to a very small set. And in fact, it was a teacher um, called Shankaracharya in the 8th century and 9th century who brought this back. He found all the old Upanishads and compiled them and wrote essays on them and revived the Upanishads in India. So just imagine 15, 1600 years after they're written or thought about, they're revived because they disappeared from Indian culture, vanished. Just like Kashmir Shaivism disappeared, just like everything disappears, you know. So, what they, if you want to study, and this is something, the Upanishads, Vedanta, this teachings of the Atma and the soul and you being that soul and you being immortal and this world being Maya and illusion and the four parts to it being Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga and Raja Yoga. You know, you've all heard these things, right? This is the teachings that came out of Vedanta, of the Upanishads. And it went into the Bhagavad Gita and came to the popular culture through the Bhagavad Gita. Now, what's really beautiful about that is that by the time it comes to the West, it comes first to the West to a couple of young authors in Massachusetts, Emerson and Thoreau, right? And It comes to them first, they get a copy of the Bhagavad Gita translated into English by a British officer who had translated it up 20 years ago. And in 1836 or something, they read it and boom, something happens. And it affects, they write about it, they talk about it. Uh, they, they wrote this amazing, he, uh, Whitman wrote this book called on, on Walden's Pond and things like that. And it was just And this movement started in America called transcendentalism that was directly affected by the Upanishads and the Gita, right? So when Swami Vivekananda came in 1893 and he brought Vedanta with him, America had already been speaking about this stuff for about 30, 40 years, right? And people in the Northeast, particularly around Boston, who's here from Boston? Anybody here from Boston? You know, hey, esoteric guides there. Hey, how are you doing, Andrew? Good. And Boston became, you know, and in fact, they started calling the elite who were intellectually committed to the Emerson philosophy, the Boston Brahmins. You know, they started calling them that and they started giving them that name. And that was the beginning of this massive absorption of Indian wisdom into, you know, in New York, you had the Theosophical Society, but they weren't doing Vedanta. They were doing Tantra. But these people, my God, they, when Vivekananda arrived and started teaching Vedanta, And then uh, America, for the first 20, 30 years of the 20th century, got what Hindu culture in America was Vedanta, right? Was Upanishads, was Swami Vivekananda, until Yogananda comes and then it becomes Kriya Yoga and Yoga and other things start happening. But just imagine Aldous Huxley, Somerset Maugham, um, you name it, uh, J.D. Salinger, um, um, Joseph Campbell. Um, you know, I could go on, you know, and, uh, my God, it's like, the people that affected the culture in the 40s and 50s and 60s came out of the education of these Vedanta ideas that we're talking about today. Isn't that a wonderful connection between us? You know, and in fact, I am a product of that export because I, am a, I came to it through Vivekananda, right? And Vivekananda also secretly practiced Tantra and advocated Vedanta because to a Christian mind or to a scientific mind, Vedanta is acceptable because it's consciousness, it's the universe, it's the mind, it's, you know, it's Spinoza's God, it's Einstein's Spinoza's God, you know, it's, it makes, you know, it, it works, it's palatable, you know, seeing a 10-handed Kali sticking a tongue out at you is not going to sell very well in 1890s America. You know, <laughs> that would not go down well. You know, that would not go down well. You know? <laughs> And in fact, you know, the, the Vivekananda's awakening was because of Kali, you know, was because of Kali, right? And um, so, 
I went the opposite route. I started teaching Tantra first, but I studied the Upanishads and Vedanta for five, six years straight, you know, with Swami Adiswarananda in New York and then with um, many other teachers, you know. There are only two universal traditions that I have found in all my search, three that, that can be called universal traditions that anybody from any faith can take on and try, which is Vedanta, Upanishads, right? Tantra, Shakti, Tantra, that whole practice of awakening your inner body to your higher self, and yoga, which is the universal alignment of your body to the universe. You know. The Upanishads were too highbrow for everybody in India. right? They were only taught to a few people in secret schools, just like Kundalini Tantra was only taught to a few people, just like, you know, it was like that, right? The... If anybody's interested, the 10 principal Upanishads are called Isha, Kena, Katha, Prashna, Aitariya, Mundaka, Taitriya, Mandukya, which we're doing today, Chandogya, and Swatisvatara. Now, each one is, one is, these are the summary of what their teachings are about. So the, the thing is that if I, Explain each one. Isha is about karma without attachment. Kena is God exists behind all natural processes. Katha is immortality is simply union with God. Prashna is a discourse on prana and energy and vayu and all the how to heal. Aitreya is creation and pure consciousness. Mundaka is knowledge and wisdom. Taitreya is you are that. Brahman. Mandukya is om and the Turiya state, which we're going to do today. And Chandogya is Tatvam Asi, you are it. And Svetvasvatara is the meditation on the ways to God. Now, these are philosophical treaties. Some are long, some are short. And the best books I have read on them, if you are interested to take this further, the best, absolute best book, starter book on the Upanishads is, in my opinion, Eknath Iswaran who is uh, an Indian teacher who lived in America and he wrote a translation of his own on the Upanishads, one of the most beautiful, psychologically aware, interesting thinking of the Upanishads that many Western scholars use to go further. The teachings of Viswami Vivekananda are also good and Sri Aurobindo's translations of the Upanishads are available in Kindle as well and eBooks are very profound, deep, East-West psychological studies of the Upanishads. So they're worth studying in that way. 